Hi, my name is Daniel Hornberg. I'm a principal scientist with SEER and I'd like to talk with you about a novel approach for unlocking deep proteomics. Let's first start discussing nanoparticles. What are nanoparticles actually? Nanoparticles are very, very small structures, ranging from the size of major protein protein complexes um, to, to small viruses. So they are very, very small in comparison to, to for example, cells, uh, but they are still large in comparison to individual proteins. Nanoparticles are used in many different fields like nanomedicine, biotechnology, pharmaceuticals, down to even environmental testing uh, or like general automobile and machinery industry. Nanoparticles are, for example, used in drug delivery. And when nanoparticles are introduced into a complex biological matrix such as human plasma, they start to assemble proteins on their outer surface. This is called the protein corona. And proteins are binding to the particles based on the physical chemical makeup of the particles. And of course, the physical chemical makeup of, of the proteins themselves. So depending on the size, the shape, the charge or the functional decoration of particles, you have a specific assembly of proteins. And then you also have indirect interactions of proteins to proteins that are also sequestered to the particles. This was a long time thought to be a detrimental effect because when you introduce, for example, in medicine, a nanoparticle into the circulation, this protein assembly is very complex. The protein corona, as we call it, is changing the properties of the particle. At SEER, we use magnetic nanoparticles and leverage the effect that they form these protein coronas. We can engineer the surface of these particles. And when they are introduced into the biological matrix, they, in a very defined way, start to assemble this protein corona. So that allows us to reproducibly assemble proteins around the nanoparticles. And we can use that to our advantage for proteomic studies. As you introduce the nanoparticle, for example, into a plasma, it starts binding proteins based on the physical chemical makeup of the particle and based on the physical chemical makeup of the proteins themselves. So this process is mainly driven by affinity, which means we can pull up proteins that are very low abundant when they have a high affinity to that particle. Now, when we compare multiple particles, what we can do is interrogate the entire dynamic range, which can easily spend more than 10 orders of magnitude and specifically enrich for proteins that are low abundant and partially deplete for proteins that are high abundant and by that covering the entire richness of information in the proteome. We have a library of more than 250 different nanoparticles we have characterized for the capability to deeply interrogate the proteome. We have integrated magnetic nanoparticles in an automated sample processing pipeline, which means we provide the nanoparticles and all the reagents, and we have an instrument that takes care of the entire sample processing so that you are just providing your biological sample, for example, a plasma, and after seven hours, you end up with a peptide you can introduce into your mass spec. We also provide a computational pipeline that takes care of QCs, normalization of the data and processing so that you can easily jump into the biological interpretation. But of course, you can also use your own downstream analytical pipelines. Let's now focus on our recent nature communication publications. I would like to share some data talking about reproducibility, depths and overall performance of the proteograph, which is an integrated platform for five nanoparticles facilitating deep proteomics. Let's first look at the reproducibility of the nanoparticle engineering itself. In this slide, you see three examples of nanoparticles with a very specific physical chemical makeup. And we look here, for example, at the size distribution. And what we see is that across different batches, our nanoparticles are extremely reproducible. And that's of course very important as we know that these physical chemical properties will drive specific protein corona formation and thus enable the nanoparticle to deeply interrogate the proteome. Another important metric for performance in proteomics is accuracy, which means how much of the quantitative information within the sample can we capture with our strategy. To evaluate the accuracy here measured as a linearity of response, 
we spiked in CRP at different concentrations that were determined by ELISA and compared the peptide intensity readout with the mass spec using our proteograph assay. What you see here is a linear response indicating that nanoparticles are able to capture the differential abundance of proteins across different samples. The way nanoparticles work are is that they compress the dynamic range, which means that low abundant proteins are becoming more abundant throughout the assay. We can visualize that by looking at the concentration versus median protein intensity plotted here on the left hand side. What we see here on the very left side is neat plasma and we see a steep slope for the regression line. For all of the three nanoparticles, that slope is less steep, indicating that low abundant proteins are made more visible to the downstream detector throughout ratio compression. Very important here again is that this line is not entirely flat, so quantitative differences are still captured when you're using the nanoparticles. Next, we were interested in looking at the dynamic range and how nanoparticles facilitate a wider and deeper coverage of the dynamic range. On the very top, you see the reference proteome from Kishishin et al. 2015. And then we overlaid the proteins detected across a panel of 10 different nanoparticles. What you see here is that we capture the entire dynamic range that spans more than 10 orders of magnitude. And in comparison to neat plasma shown at the very bottom, we get particularly more proteins at the lower abundance range. These are the hard to get proteins, but usually also the proteins you are very interested in in your biological study. When we look at the performance of individual nanoparticles here on the left-hand side, we see that the best particle get, gets you more than three X the number of protein IDs compared to a neat plasma. Importantly, that is not compromising your precision measured as a coefficient of variation here. This is particularly important since we are talking about a much, much deeper proteome where we are quantifying the very low abundant proteins Given the automation uh, that we provide with the proteograph, this whole complexity is basically simplified in a way that it doesn't compromise your precision while giving you a much, much higher depth. The combination of different particles allows us to get deep into the proteome. So we were next wondering how do these proteins differ in terms of pathways and protein families they belong to looking across different particles. The results are indicated here in these heat maps. By red, we indicate protein families that are increased with a particular nanoparticle. With blue, we indicate protein families that are reduced with a particular nanoparticle. And what you see here is that certain particles enrich with certain annotations. And by that, you can combine particles to specifically interrogate certain protein families or functional groups, or you can go very broad by taking another selection of nanoparticles that capture almost all proteins in your sample. Next, we wish to assess the utility of nanoparticles to investigate a clinical cohort. For that, we took 141 cancer subjects and healthy controls and interrogated their plasma proteome down to a depth of 2,499 proteins using a panel of five different nanoparticles. As you can see here, a depletion of these particular samples only yielded us around 490 proteins, indicating that with a five nanoparticle panel, you can get a much, much deeper proteome and potentially much, much better readout in terms of biology and biological signatures on the protein level. Next, we evaluated how we can use that biologically rich data set to identify novel protein biomarkers, potentially novel protein biomarkers for early cancer detection. We used a random forest classification algorithm that gave us a pretty good performance measured here as the AUC of 0.91. On the right-hand side, you see a combination of proteins and respective nanoparticles that were the most important factors to, to stratify between these two groups. And among these proteins, we have a couple of already known, but also potentially new protein biomarkers for cancer detection. In summary, engineered nanoparticles enable unbiased, deep, robust, rapid and scalable proteomics by leveraging the unique interaction that happens between nanoparticles and proteins 
based on their physical chemical properties. With a set of only five nanoparticles, we were able to interrogate a clinical cohort of 141 cancer subjects and healthy controls to a depth of 2,499 proteins. Of course, the utility of the proteograph goes beyond that. We are now interrogating deep proteomes in order to get more information about PTMs, about protein-protein interactions, about SNPs, as well as isoforms and splice variants. So proteograph not only allows us to go deep into the proteome and quantify proteins, but we also get protein, protein interaction information. We get information on the peptide level, which means we can look at PTMs as well as at SNPs and splice variants. And by that, we access a much, much broader pool of biological information in your sample in a streamlined manner that can work at the scale where we can meet the genomics folks and enable proteogenomics studies. Thank you very much for your attention. Stay curious.